Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight for this uh, special guest event on refugees as human shields at the Oxford Refugee Studies Center. I'm Dr. Anne Irfan. I am a departmental lecturer in forced migration here at the Refugee Studies Center. And tonight I will be speaking with Professor Neve Gordon, who is Professor of International Law and Human Rights at Queen Mary University of London. Professor Gordon's work, in addition to law and human rights, also looks at the ethics of violence and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. His books include Israel's Occupation, published in 2008 with the University of California Press. More recently, The Human Right to Dominate, co-authored with Nicola Perugini and published with OUP in 2015. And then most recently, and the focus of our talk today, uh, this book published earlier this year, Human Shields, A History of People in the Line of Fire, also co-authored with Nicola Perugini. So Neve is joining us tonight to discuss this most recent book, and in particular, the construction of refugees as human shields. Now, uh, Neve and I are quite conscious that many people are suffering from Zoom fatigue as we head into the end of this year. So what we're planning to do to keep this as dynamic as possible is divide the session into two parts. For the first half hour, Neve and I will be in conversation about this book and about refugees being constructed as human shields. I will ask Neve a series of questions beginning with the legal definition of human shields and the different types of human shields. And we're then hoping to take you on a brief geographical journey from Iraq to Hungary and all the way to the US-Mexico border, discussing how human shields help expose the colonial and the race racial traces in international law and how these manifest themselves in what Neve calls refugee shields. After that first half hour, we plan to have the second 30 minutes open for Q&A from all of you and some open discussion. Um, just some housekeeping about how this is going to work. Uh, you can enter your questions into the chat box at any time while Neve and I are speaking. You won't be able to see other people's questions, but uh, don't worry, they're all feeding in to us. You won't see your own questions either. And once we are done with our conversation, we will then go through the questions and try and group them to answer as many as we can. So without further ado, let's begin. Uh, Neve, could you kick us off by explaining what exactly are human shields? Uh, so first, thank you very much, Anne. Thank you for inviting me. And I'd like to thank the Refugee Studies Center at Oxford for making this possible. Uh, and so I'm gonna share my screen because I've prepared some slides, if that's okay. And then uh, I'll begin. I think this is the right one. Oops, just a minute. Do you see this? Yeah. And, yeah, okay. So <clears throat> your question was, what exactly are human shields? So according to international law, a uh, human shield is a protected person, like a civilian or a prisoner of war, who is either forced or volunteers to defend a legitimate military target in order to deter the enemy from attacking the target. So human shields in a broad sense are human beings whose bodies become weapons in order to deter some kind of military offensive. Uh, you can see this is a picture from uh, a computer game and it's how, computer, how human shields have entered the, the gaming world where someone is using another person's body as a shield. Now, the 1977 additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions defines human shields in the following way. The presence or movement of the civilian population or individual civilians shall not be used to render certain points or areas immune from military operations, 
particular in attempts to shield military objectives from attacks or to shield or favor or impede military operations. Now, this is a very legal language and many things can be said about this definition, but I will limit myself to one absolutely critical aspect. The law here operates through the paradoxical movement of avowal and disavowal. It avows the protected status of human shields by rendering it illegal to use civilians or prisoners of war as human shields, but it also disavows their protected status by asserting that human shields will not render an area immune from attack. In other words, while outlawing the use of human shields, the law actually enables warring parties in certain circumstances to legally kill them. Thank you, Neve. But I, uh, I guess this does raise the question, this is sort of a singular definition, aren't there different types of shields or human shields? So, most scholars will tell you that there are two different kinds of human shields, involuntary human shields and voluntary human shields. The first kind refers to people who are coerced into becoming a shield. Many of you probably remember the case of the Kashmiri that was tied to the Jeep, or maybe even the iron cages where in, in Syria, a rebel group uh, prisoners of war or civilians in iron cages. And these are examples of involuntary shields, the, the people that are coerced to becoming shields. The second kind are the, the voluntary shields. It refers to the civilians who actively, willingly, and nonviolently attempt to protect a target. A well-known example is uh, Rachel Corey, who was crushed to death while trying to protect the Palestinian house in the Gaza Strip. But I also brought you an, a, 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 a two other images. One, the first one was of the veterans protecting indigenous uh, uh, Native Americans at Standing Rock, where 2,000 veterans went to protect them. And this image in front of you is what we call echo shielding, where, where uh, um, Greenpeace activists use their bodies to protect whales against whale hunting. Uh, I will only say here that in our, and we did an analysis of over a thousand articles in the media looking at human shields in war zones between 2015 and 2016. And out of these articles, we found seven instances of uh, voluntary shields, 9,500 instances of involuntary shields. But together, these two groups compri comprised only 1% only of all the shielding accusations. 1% of all the shielding accusations. The rest were three other three million civilians that were also cast as human shields. So, if there are ninety nine percent, or you said three million civilians who are also cast as shields, but are neither of these two categories of voluntary or involuntary, then what are they? What are this remaining ninety nine percent of human shields? So. We call the third kind proximate shields. And in order to actually understand how shielding relates to refugees, we need to better understand how the proximate shield operates. Now, consider the appearance of human shields in Mosul, Iraq, in the days leading up to the Iraqi government and the US coalition to recapture the city from ISIS hands. Uh, this was 2016, and suddenly what we saw in the press is that a lot of different actors were blaming ISIS from holding human shields. It began with the Pope saying that ISIS was holding a few hundred people's human shields. 
And then this was during the election here in the United States. And President Trump said basically that there is a thousand human shields being held by ISIS. But suddenly, to our amazement, uh, the UN came out with a press release saying ISIS holds 100,000 human shields in Mosul's old city. Now, there's ample and overwhelming evidence that ISIS did actually uh, 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 use brutal mechanisms to hold people as human shields in Mosul. And yet the claim that a few hundred militants that were still in the city were deploying 100,000 human shields seemed to us to be a blatant exaggeration. Now, at that point, we understood that the issue of framing is very important uh, to human shielding and that most of these shields are shields because one of the warring parties claims them as, as human shields. And this allows that warring party to take certain legal actions, um, to take certain legal actions that will uh, 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 enable them to use uh, more aggressive or different repertoires of violence. And in that way, uh, uh, maybe to kill civilians. But then these civilians, once they're framed as human shield, the, the party that kills them is not to blame, but rather the party that deployed them. So the, the Americans and the Iraqis, as they were heading towards Mosul, had a vested interest in framing the civilian population that was left in the city as human shields, because if any civilians die, then according to the law, it would be uh, ISIS to blame rather than them. So we understood uh, uh, that, that uh, civilians caught in a, war, in a war zone, particularly in urban settings, are often framed as human shields. But when we looked at it closer, we, we, we noticed that this is not always the case. Not always civilians trapped in cities are framed as human uh, shields. And actually it is only in those instances when the civilians are trapped near non-state militaries, non-state militants, that they are framed as human shields. So when the Hamas, for example, bombs uh, uh, Tel Aviv and aims its rockets at Israel's central command, which is right at the center of Tel Aviv, and it injures civilians or maybe even kills a civilian in Tel Aviv, then it will be blamed for killing civilians. But when Israel bombs Hamas sites in Gaza, the Strip, and it kills uh, Palestinian civilians, then these civilians are framed as human shields. So what the framing has to do not with the idea that civilians are trapped in urban settings, but rather because they are close to non-state militaries. Finally, we noticed that if we looked at those 3 million cases that appeared in the newspapers, whereby uh, uh, civilians were framed as uh, uh, proximate shields, we saw that all of them, or practically all of them, are in the former colonies, and practically all of them relate to, to, to people of color. So, at the same time, what there was the 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 military uh, <clears throat> the military the war between uh, the U the Ukraine and Russia, and yet at that time no one was framed as a human shield there. But in Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Gaza, constantly we saw framing of human shields. So basically, 
the, the proximate shield is the shield that is framed near the non-state milit the non-state militants. They are mostly people of color in the former colonies. Um, thank you, Neve. Just on a technical point, we're getting a couple of reports of some sound issues um, and that your voice has been dropping out a couple of times. So I wonder if we want to just try turning off the cameras. Um, so that we can ensure people hear everything. I will do the same. Um, and just to recap what you said, the point was that how shields, are, how human shields are framed is critical. There is a strong colonial and racial dimension to so-called proximate shielding. And it's actually this racialized proximate shielding that comprises the majority of people who are today cast as shields particularly in relation to their proximity to non-state militants. So just moving on from this, Neve, can you explain why this is significant and in particular how it relates to refugees? So in order to get to the refugee, I need to backtrack one more time and in order to look at the development of international law. Um, as third world uh, 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 legal scholars have taught us from Tony Angie to B.S. Chimney and Anne Orford, uh, the laws of armed conflict were not applicable to colonial wars. When colonial states killed colonized subjects, they did so without violating international law. Indeed, colonial subjects were considered outside international law's fear of protection for a variety of reasons, which I can discuss with you and I. But what happened is that after the Second World War, there was a progressive movement that manifested in a massive codification project, which included both an increase of protection bestowed on civilians and the extension of civilian status to the populations within the former colony. So suddenly, the, for the first time, the former colonies joined the family of nations and received the protect, protections that international law offers civilians. Now, this progressive movement reached its peak with the publication of the 1977 edition protocols that expanded the category of civilian to include the decolonized populations. I will just note here that we witness a parallel process with re respect to international refugee law. First, with the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees, and later with the 1967 optional protocol. In our book, we show that this progressive process was arrested after the war on terror was launched. Not only has the value assigned to civilian lives been diminishing, but the extension of civilianhood to the ex-colonized has also been, been undermined. And we see this is precisely when high-tech militaries frame civilian populations as human shields. One of our arguments is that the human shield, which is a killable subject, has in a sense replaced the colonized subject. Indeed, we demonstrate in the book how high-tech militaries mobilize the legal phrase human shields to justify civilian death in the former colonies. Those attacking Mosul in 2016 could, in other words, say, that ISIS was responsible for the thousands of civilians who died during the campaign. Now, what led us to human shields is precisely Mosul, because suddenly, right before the attack began, the United Nations Refugee Agency, the UNHCR, uh, um, came out with a press release uh, basically accusing ISIS of using 100,000 civilians as human shields. And 
we couldn't really understand where this press release was coming from. So, Neve, if I just can jump in here, we've got to the point or the connection with refugees via UNHCR making this statement about human shields in relation to Iraq and Daesh. But did you uncover actually why it was that UNHCR was putting out a press release about the ostensible use of human shields in Mosul? Um, not really. Can you hear me okay now, And. Um, yes, although someone has suggested, um, because you are still dropping a little bit, it might work better if you can in any way sit closer to the microphone. Okay. Uh, what we did is we immediately sent out an email to, to uh, the US NCR, uh, UNHCR uh, press uh, officer and asked her, where was this coming from? Why was a refugee agency putting out a press release about human shields in Mosul? And she said she'd get right back to us. She didn't, we wrote back. She said she'd get back to us. And ultimately we never heard uh, uh, from them. Uh, but it was this press release that led us to look at migrants and refugees trying to enter Europe. We noticed, for example, that refugees who hoped to cross Hungary on their way to Central Europe were violently repelled by riot police and soldiers. Responding to criticism that it was using extreme measures against asylum seekers, the Hungarian government asserted that it had merely reacted to the violence on behalf of the mob, an armed mob, and I'm quoting, were using kids as human shields. Human shielding accusations has traveled with the Iraqi and Syrian civilians to Europe. Those who were either coercively deployed as shields in cities like Mosul and Raqqa or framed as proximate shields by Western states were now being cast by Hungary as people who have no qualms about using women and children as shields when they try to enter Europe. It is a, as if the figure of the human, of the shield migrated together with the refugees, moving with them from war zones in the global South on their journey to seek asylum. We then looked more closely and found that the charges were actually prevalent wherever there was relatively large movements of migrants and refugees from the global south to the global north. When the migrant caravan began making its way towards the US border, President Donald Trump initially characterized them as invaders who sheltered among their ranks unknown Middle Easterners. And U.S. Secretary of State Michael Pompeo warned the American people that the migrants were, and I'm quoting, putting women and children in front of this caravan to use as shields as they make their way through. The use of military vocabulary, invasion, insurgency, and human shields to describe such migrants is, of course, calculated. Political leaders use the human shielding accusation to potentially achieve three things. First, not unlike proximate shields in war zones, framing women and children who are seeking refugees as human shields renders them not immune from attack. Second, it reinforces the trope of the barbaric brown man exploiting brown women and children. And third, the militarization of the border, the transformation of the migrants into a horde of barbarian insurgents who deploy human shields are all part of a concerted effort to undermine one of the key humanitarian institutions that has provided hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people with protections since the end of World War II, namely asylum. At the border, as in the war zones, 
The framing of vulnerable populations, the majority of whom are non-white, as human shields strips them of some of the protections that international law has sought, sought to provide with, them with. Thank you, Neve. This is quite a powerful demonstration of the connection between proximate shielding and attempts to undermine the asylum system. So by way of conclusion, and before we open this up to questions, and actually a reminder to everyone to please post your questions in the chat box. By way of conclusion, Neve, could you say a few more words about the political implications of this kind of framing of vulnerable populations as human shields? So legally speaking, the protections offered to both civilians and refugees have followed the trajectory of a pandemic. Both groups were denied protections prior to World War II, and only with the post-war codification process, several protections were bestowed upon them, reaching a zenith point in the late 20th century. This progressive process then began to plummet with the War on Terror. The War on Terror, in other words, has not only helped create new refugees, it has also undermined some of the legal protections offered to them. Not unlike civilian traps in war zones in Iraq, Yemen, and Gaza, when non-white asylum seekers demand entry into Western states, they are then framed using the same language, even if in a different context. These asylum seekers are now widely depicted as deliberately violating the distinction between combatant and non-combatant, purportedly shielding themselves behind women and children in order to gain an advantage against militants. They are framed as perpetrators of a war crime, even though they are not waging an armed struggle and in many cases are simply trying to escape one. I would like to conclude with an image of one such refugee shield. Using anti-riot gear, including large transparent shields, a group of Mexican police officers are seen confronting a mother and her terrified son. The boy has no shirt on and is wailing as his mother holds on to him. Clearly, clearly she too is scared. The scattered clothing and trampled rails lying, rails lying underneath their feet are evidence that the photograph was taken in the midst or even towards the end of a violent struggle. One police officer raises his hand as if to shoo the two migrants away. The mother and child are the refugee shields, ostensibly sent forward by brown men they are the ones from whom President Trump has framed as an existential threat to the United States. This is precisely the figure that has been mobilized as a rallying cry aimed at uniting American people behind the harsh measures the White House has adopted against non-white foreigners in search of asylum. Yet the only threatening elements in this photograph are the police holding transparent riot shields as instruments of defense against the refugee shields. In the image, the migrants become real people and what the viewer sees is misery and vulnerability. The ju juxtaposition of the two different kinds of shields, the transparent inanimate shields next to the refugee shield actually reveals something significant about the contemporary global order. The transparent shield is a weapon that is used to uphold law and order and to defend a country's border against the infiltration of the other kind of shield, the refugee shield. This image thus exposes how the law helps produce and reinforce the vulnerability of civilians, transforming them into targets of violence while enabling law Abide, while enabling law-abiding nation states to deny these migrants the right to seek asylum. Okay, thank you very much, Neve, for this very compelling account of how 
human shields connect to refugees. I'm sure everyone is virtually clapping. Um, I'm getting mixed reports about the sound quality. So perhaps if for the Q&A, you could just try and stay really close to your microphone as far as possible. Um, and I would invite the audience to continue submitting questions via the chat box. The questions come in so far for you, Neve, saying you mentioned that human shields have replaced colonial subjects and asking if you could explain this further. Um, so basically in colonial wars, the law was un inapplicable, was, was considered inapplicable by the colonizing state, the, the international law. And it was considered inapplicable for many reasons. One of the reasons was that it was not conceived as an international, as an international conflict. It was considered, the colonial war was considered a war with non-state actors and non-state actors were not recognized by international law until 1977. And there was really no distinction between the civilian population and the combatants in, among the colonized. And so basically the law that was applicable in this colonial setting was the state's law. And the colonial rebellions were considered acts of treason or, or something within the state. It was completely inapplicable to them. Only when after decolonization, when the, the colonized, uh, the, the decolonized states joined the so-called family of nations and became nation states, did international law become applicable to them? And the protections international law offers became protection offered to the civilians of the former colonies. And suddenly killing them in masses, in masses was considered a war crime. Now, what we see is not long after that happens with the 1977 protocol, which is suddenly a recognition of the protected status of the civilian in the former colony, we suddenly see the appearance of different mechanisms in which to justify the killing of civilians in the former colonies. And what, what our, uh, our, our uh, media analysis of 2015 and 2016 showed us that 3 million people were categorized, cast, framed as human shields. And this prepares the ground that if a high-tech military kills them, then the party to blame for their death is not the one that's pulling the trigger, but the one that's supposedly or ostensibly deploying them as human shields. So if ISIS is controlling Raqqa in Syria, and the 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 so and 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 the and, and, and a high tech military bombs Raqqa, then ultimately and civilians die. Then ultimately, those that deployed these human shields are to blame of carrying out the war crimes, and not those who actually killed them. And what the the only thing I'll add is, so what you the human shield becomes a mechanism of reducing the protections offered to civilians. And therefore it, it becomes also a mechanism of reducing protections offered to refugees. I will add one last thing before we move on. When the refugee is framed as a human shield, when that woman and child are framed as a human shield, what it tells us is that behind them is a legitimate military target because the definition of a human shield is a, a, a protected person who defends a legitimate military target. Thereby the men behind them or the population behind them of other migrants and refugees are considered legitimate targets because if they, they weren't legitimate targets, these people would not be human shields, if that makes sense. 
So in terms of the human shield replacing the colonized subject, this relates mostly to the notion that they are legitimate targets. That, that they become not legitimate targets, but rather that they are not immune from attack right. and it changes the blame for their killing. So if I would kill someone, usually a civilian, I would be to blame if I shot the person. But if you are holding that person as a human shield and I killed that person, then you would actually be to, be, be to blame according to the law. And therefore, by framing everyone in the city as a human shield, I, I in kind of preempt the blame and any civilian that dies is your fault. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Juliet Frontier. She asks, how should, the how should the future of refugee protection and refugee law respond to this framing of refugees as human shields? I think they should reject it. I think everything about it is, uh, is wrong. First of all, it's, it, it, it reeks of the civilizing mission. It reeks of, of the, the idea of not only framing the refugee as a shield, but of the framing of the refugees as barbaric. They are the ones sending uh, uh, their women and children uh, before them, but also they do not know how to make the distinctions that we as civilized people know how to make. So there's this whole idea of how do we frame the refugees that are trying to enter Western countries as savages and as barbaric and therefore that becomes part of the justification of rejecting them and part of it, and, and it becomes a kind of, um, a kind of uh, 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 way to ensure that we're not culpable if we hurt them. There are, that woman and child in the last image that I showed you, there's, they're not human shields. They're a woman and child trying to Across a border and stopped in a very brutal way by police forces, okay? But then they're framed as human shields so that if something happens to them, it's not the police that are to blame, but the people that send them. And, and, and these people are, are part of an insurgency trying to invade our countries. And this whole military language becomes part of what we know as the most vulnerable people, the, the refugees, the people that have no rights at all, uh, uh, are suddenly framed as these barbaric uh, invaders. So yeah, we just have to say this is false news. This is fake news. If we want to be using Trump's term. <laughs> Thank you, Neve. Uh, next question is from Catherine Bridick. Uh, she points out that, as you say, the laws on uh, internal uh, armed conflict and the conduct of war emerged after much of the world had already been subject to colonial domination. So in view of this, isn't the problem that, colon not that colonized peoples, sorry, isn't the problem that colonized peoples were not considered to be human rather than the problem being that the laws of war didn't apply for them? And if so, could we say that the, refu the treatment of refugees now also stems from the fact that they are not considered human? Yes, my explanation before was uh, at best imprecise, completely not full. And there's several other aspects of it. And one of, the, one of these aspects is that they were not considered fully, the colonized subject was not considered fully human, exactly like you say. And uh, what we say in the introduction to our book is that the history of human shielding is a history of the border of who is considered human, where human is, is a political category rather than a biological one. And, and, and the idea that the colonized subjects could not be human shields even if they wanted to, because they were not human. 
So we don't find instances of uh, uh, people of color being used as human shields till much later. We, we begin the book from the Civil War in the United States, uh, where it's human against human fighting each other, human against human fighting each other. But in the city uh, that is being bombed in, in Charlotte, where we're looking at our first instance of human shielding, not only 70% of the population in the city at the time, which were African-Americans, when did not even enter the discussions of human shielding, but also women and children are not uh, part of human shielding because they were not considered fully human at the time. So the history of human shielding is a history of human. And, and in the colonial setting, we hardly see or very rarely will find, come across instances of human shielding. And international law was written alongside colonialism. And so it's not only that a dimension that you're adding to my previous answer, but another dimension that you intimated is that it was written in advance, not only to regulate European wars, but also to justify the colonial enterprise and the imperial enterprise. So it, it, it is inflected, international law has always been inflected by the colonial project from the very beginning. Okay, thank you, Neve. Uh, next question is from Thomas Nordberg. <coughs> he asks, how does international law deal with Hamas using human shields and are there consequences for the terror organization? He asks, has, a, has the ICC pronounced on or issued judgments involving human shields and are there international legal instruments that speak of human shields? So the question is, first of all, we need to ask the question whether Hamas uses human shields. Now, Israel constantly claims that Hamas uses human shield. And it has put out the infographic that I showed you and scores of other infographics and scores of other claims. And if Hamas uses human shields and Israel kills civilians when it attacks Gaza, then Hamas is to blame for the civilian death in, in not Israel. So we see that Israel has a vested interest in framing Palestinians in the Gaza Strip as human shields and, and claiming that Hamas uses human shields. Now, the, the, the question we need to ask ourselves in what sense is Hamas using human shields? And it's clearly not in the forced sense of, of tying someone to a jeep or holding someone in a way against their, their, their interest. The kind of human shields that we've come across in the Gaza Strip are two kinds. It's the voluntary shield, it's the Rachel Corys of the world, the ISM and so forth, that uh, go to Gaza in order to volunteer as human shields. And then it's what's called the proximate shields. And proximate shields, I would say, are, uh, are, are a complicated term because if every civilian in the Gaza Strip is a shield because Hamas is firing rockets from within Gaza City, and it is firing rockets from within Gaza City of Israel, it would also mean that me as a, uh, as a resident of Be'er Sheva in Israel, where, the, where Israel's southern command is in the center of the city, could also be framed as a human shield. And I don't want to be framed as a human shield because I'm living in Be'er Sheva while Be'er Sheva is, 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 is bombed by Hamas. Uh, I'm a civilian and I don't want to be framed as human shield. And if I die as a result of a Hamas rocket, I don't want the Hamas to say, oh, it was Israel's fault because Israel used me as a human shield. So I have not found instances of involuntary human shielding in the Gaza Strip. There's plenty of instances of proximate shields, but these proximate shields for me 
are civilians and, and should not be treated as shields. Um, I hope that answered your question. I just forgot though, in the previous questionnaire asked me about what's the status of refugees. And the, the, the status of refugees, as Hannah Arendt already taught us a, a, a long time ago, is that the, the rights, human rights are bound by the nation state. We, 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 we get our rights through our membership to a community, to a member state. And when someone loses this membership and does not belong to a political community anymore, and all that remains is their humanness, the, all that they are is human, at that moment, when they most need rights, they are rightless. They don't even have a right to have rights. And these are the refugees. And what the international law tried to correct in 1951 and with the, the optional protocols of 1967 is to... to to bestow the refugees with a series of rights. And what we see now is that these rights are again being taken away. Thank you, Neve. Um, another question this time from an anonymous attendee said, uh, you mentioned many quotes framing human shields as children and women. Can we therefore say that human shields are both racialized and gendered? And if so, what does that mean for racialized a male asylum seekers from the global south, i.e. the military target. Yes, so as I explained in a previous answer, um, <clears throat> in, in the late 19th century, uh, early 20th century, there's women and children cannot be human shields. Suddenly today, all the human shields are only women and children, or almost only in Iraq, in Syria, and so forth. So there's a very strong gender dimension. Then we started trying to make sense is, okay, it's clear that women and children are now human shields, but why only women and children? Why men are not considered? Now, any man that, that is killed in these conflict zones in the, milita in, in the Middle East, is what's considered a military aged man. If they're between, I don't know, 13, 14 and 70, they're military aged men and therefore they can be killed and they're not counted as civilians when they're killed. You have to prove that they were civilians in order to have them counted as civilians. The default is that they're counted as militants. And therefore, there are no men that are not militants in the Middle East. And therefore, you cannot kill civilian men in the Middle East. And all you can kill is civilian women and children. And if you don't want to be blamed for killing civilian women and children, then they, they are, you know, it's a kind of, I'm, I'm simplifying it. And it, of course, it's not always the case like that. But generally, that's what we see. And so that's what I was trying to get at at the, one of the previous comments, is that when we frame the refugee women and children as human shields at the border, what we're saying, or what we're intimating, legally speaking, is that those behind them are legitimate targets. So the men that are supposedly behind the women and children refugee shields are supposedly target and people that can be subjected to violence. And, and the same if we return to the Gaza Strip and try to draw all these connections for well over a year, a year and a half, or, uh, in the Gaza Strip, we've been seeing these protests every Friday going to the fence and Palestinian protesting. And Israel is claiming they're using human shields. By claiming that these protesters are using human shields, it inadvertently is claiming that the protesters themselves are military targets. Because the human shield is always in front of a legitimate military target. Thank you, Neven. Uh, 
there's a question from Juliet Frontier that actually connects to that quite well. Uh, thinking up, picking up what you've said about military targets, she asks, what are the so-called legitimate military targets that refugees are said to be supposedly shielding in the eyes of nation states? The refugee men, the, the people behind them. And so it, it once you, once it, it's exactly what is the shield behind them? The only thing behind them is the men. And, and supposedly they're sending the women and children to deter an attack on them. And so they are a target. Now, who's claiming that they're sending? They're not sending, claiming they're sending women and children. This is how the whole border interaction is framed by those protecting the border. So that means that those protecting the border actually see the migrants and the refugees as invaders in the military sense. And the whole military language is inserted here. Now, what is interesting is that what we see in the war zones and then in the refugees is this kind of blurring of the military and civil spheres. And it happens at the border where this blurring completely takes place. And then later, and as I've shown a bit in some of the uh, uh, instances, we see it more and more often in civil protest. And one of the reasons we're seeing it in civil protest is because of the militarization of the police forces. And that has to do with the militarization of the borders, Orders that once were once not as militarized as they are today are becoming more and more militarized. And then in the cities, inside the Western cities, we see police forces with Humvees and helicopters, and in some US cities, even with tanks, police forces, not US guards, okay? And they're going in to stop the protests, and suddenly we see shields, but in, in, inside the US, the shielding will be, or inside England or, or Europe, the shielding will be different because the shields there will be the white people shielding the people of color. While at the border, all you have is people of color and therefore you, you can have inside this, inside you can have veterans shielding uh, uh, the indigenous uh, population. So suddenly you have male shields inside the US. On the border, you will not have male shields because it's only people of color and therefore it is the women and children that will be the human shields. Uh, you've spoken there to uh, another couple of questions, actually, that I'll, I'll raise now together because they're, they're interlinked. So both from anonymous attendees asking about domestic analogies in view of the fact you've spoken, you spoke predominantly in your talk about uh, the international context, and international law. So a couple of people have asked about how the idea of human shields has been used to justify police killings in various domestic contexts, which obviously you just alluded to. And someone else has asked specifically, haven't we seen this uh, same thing happen with Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter protests? So let me add only that there's a, a major problem uh, with the voluntary human shielding that we need to at least be self-reflective and aware of. So what we've seen in protests, can, particularly, it, it became very widespread uh, uh, since the murder of George Floyd in, in Minnesota. Uh, we've seen massive amounts of human shielding across U.S. protests. There was the Mama Shields in Portland, and there's the Veteran Shields, and this and that. And it, it's, it's what, what you'll find in all these instances, it's white on black shielding. It's the whites using their privilege as whites in a white supremacist society to shield the people of color, to shield black African-Americans. The problem, and this Banu Bargu has pointed out uh, several years ago, that on the one hand, this is a very courageous act. You're putting your, your, your body in the line of fire 
to protect another person uh, 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 from violent attack. On the other hand, by doing that, you're reinscribing and reinforcing the social hierarchies that the protest is protesting because you're reinforcing your privilege and reinscribing it as a defense, okay? And suddenly the white man or the white woman, we need them to protect the black victim. And that's extremely problematic. And, it, and, 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 and there is a lot of discussion about that within the Black Lives Matter movement and, and, and how to kind of overcome that paradox of human shielding that, that re-inscribes the very privilege that it fights against, okay? But it is widespread and in the book, uh, we discuss this kind of shielding, we discuss uh, uh, echo shielding, the environment where human shielding has taken on a, a major role. And, the, and, and as I mentioned, and, and even how it has entered our, uh, the comfort of our homes through computer games and so forth. Thank you, Neve. Uh, we are almost out of time. So just close with uh, fi one final question. I'm very sorry to everyone whose questions we haven't had time to get to, but uh, fairly, um, hopefully a fairly quick question here again from an anonymous attendee who asked, are there examples of the UK using this construct of refugee shields? The UK, I haven't come across it. And one reason I think is because it's, it, do, it doesn't have a land border. And so I haven't, if the cases we've come across like Czechoslovakia, Mexico, the United States, Hungary, is usually when the shields arrive through, uh, through land. So I haven't come across the refugee shield. We have come across instances of civil protest with a bit of human shielding, but again, much less so than the United States because the police here are much less violent than the police in the United States. In terms of, if you look at the, the police in the United States, they come dressed as robocops with their Humvees, with their stun grenades and gas grenades and so forth. Now this, it's not that this doesn't happen in the UK, but it doesn't happen as often and not as recently uh, as it happens in the United States. So we, we have come across instances of uh, civilians in the UK being you, be volunteering to be human shields in civil protests but not anywhere near the cases we have come across in the United States. Okay, thank you so much, Ni, for answering so many questions. Uh, again, I'm very sorry to everyone whose questions we didn't get to. Uh, in particular, there are a couple of people who asked several. Uh, so obviously do get in touch directly if you'd like to discuss further. I'd also say there's several questions that I think are addressed in the book itself. So I'd encourage you all to read it. I would highly recommend it. And the main thing left is to thank Professor Neve Gordon so much for coming to speak to us this evening, for giving up his time and for giving such a thought-provoking and a powerful explication, not only of human shields, but of how these might, this concept of human shields might uh, engender thinking about refugees in a different sense as well. So thank you very much, Neve. Thank you, Anne, and thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't get to see your faces. Thank you.